unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant the Masha. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you're a fan of National Public Radio. And if you listen to NPR, chances are you've heard of the journalist, Arthi Shahani. She's reported on some of the biggest technology stories in the world. Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook, Arthi's covered them all. But there's one story you may not have heard of, and that's Arthi's own. In a new memoir, Here We Are, American Dreams, American Nightmares, Arthi documents her family's journey from partition-era India to Casablanca to Queens, New York. Arthi's parents came to America with little money in their pockets and no legal documents to remain in the U.S. Battling poverty, discrimination, and wayward business partners, the Shahani family manages to make it until one day nearly everything falls apart. See, Arthi's father was arrested and falsely accused of operating an electronic store that was a front for the Cali drug cartel. What followed was a jail sentence for Arthi's father in New York's notorious Rikers Island prison and a years-long struggle to fight off deportation. This plot sounds like a made-for-Netflix special, but this is real life. This is Arthi's story. Arthi Shahani joins me today on the phone from Oakland. Arthi, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's great to be here with you while we are all sheltered in place here. Exactly. Um, So first off, I want to congratulate you on the book and all of the amazing reviews you've earned. Um, You know, this, this memoir really just blew me away. I have so many questions for you, but let me start by asking you about the motivation behind writing the book. Now, you have been a journalist for many years, and you're pretty much used to telling millions of people around the world every day other people's stories. When did you finally realize that you wanted to tell your own story in this way? Well, you know, I think this story of my family's unusual journey, of my journey, right, from being an undocumented immigrant as a kid in Queens Uh, to becoming the voice for national public radio in Silicon Valley, the global epicenter of power. Um, That kind of journey, um, in some ways, it's really unique. In some ways, it's kind of classically American. Um, And I think over the years, I've felt that disconnect between what my public voice is, what I talk about when I'm holding that microphone, versus what my backstory is. You know, I'd imagine, for example, I joke, it's like, if you've ever heard my voice, you can think of me as like the Indian IT lady on NPR talking about Google and Facebook and algorithms and, you know, uh, power and billionaires. And it's like, yeah, I'm that. But like, it feels like a kind of whitewashing of who I actually am. (laughs) Um, And I think that, you know, sometime around 2016, 2017, um, with political shifts in the U.S., I kind of got to feeling just like this existential urgency to let my country know, hey, this is who this immigrant American really is. This is what it took to get here. Man, it was a messy ride. And you might think of me, by the way, as a quote unquote good immigrant. Um, and I want you to know that my father, who was my best friend, ultimately, we didn't start that way, but we ended that way. He was a so-called, quote unquote, bad immigrant, and we're tied at the hip, uh, joined at the hip. Our our struggles are intertwined together, and we fought like crazy to make this country home. So when you document your family's story, it had so many painful, difficult twists and turns. Uh, You know, did the idea of revisiting the past ever give you pause about kind of, you know, retelling your family's story, especially in such a public way? of course. I mean, you know, give me pause, let alone such a public way. I mean, put that aside, just to actually revisit painful moments in the past. You know, this is like an interesting thing about trauma, which is that um, the things that have caused you the deepest pain and heartache in life, they're often the most important things to revisit. It's where you can mine and learn so much about yourself, about the world, deeper truths, but they're really hard to go to, right? And so for me, uh, even though the story has been part of my life for for a long time, um, I know for me personally, I needed to feel a lot more confidence in my own life and my future 
um, having a good career, uh, having a good credit score, you know, like, like, you know, uh, by the end of my 20s, beginning of my 30s, even though I've been to very good schools, I had no money in the bank. I had no clear, you know, sort of profession. Um, I'd been fighting to keep my family in this country. And I let my credit score just hit really, really low. And, you know, I think that once I felt more confidence in my position in life, um, that gave me permission to explore this, the tough stuff, you know? And, and may I ask you, I know that you're the interviewer here, but I'm just kind of curious, what spoke to you about it? Well, what spoke to me about the book is, you know, I too am an Indian uh, American, uh, and my parents came from India in the late 1960s. And I think of my experience as the kind of quintessential Indian American middle class upbringing. You know, I was raised in Houston, Texas. Both of my parents are professionals. We were certainly not rich by any standard, but we had a reasonably comfortable, you know, kind of middle class existence. And I feel like so much of the literature I've read, the people I grew up with, the the stories I see on TV about the Indian American experience are are kind of similar to mine. I can I can sort of relate in some way. And that's really just one piece of this overall picture, right? Um, I mean, that's the average experience, which means there are, there are experiences on, on... I don't think that it's average. Yeah, I don't think it's the average experience. I just think that it's the one that's been narratively written about the most, and that has to do with access and power. Right. And so when I came across your story, I said, wow, you know, this is really telling us something that has been there for a long time, but we haven't we haven't focused on it, right? It hasn't been part of the popular culture. Um, And of course, your particular story, the story of the Shahani family was so compelling and told in such, um, with such immediacy, but also in such rich detail that, uh, you know, it was, it was sort of a page turner. Um, And, you know, I want to sort of bring our listeners through your story, but starting kind of at the beginning with your, where your parents came from, both of your parents came from, partition families whose homes are, I guess, today located in modern day Pakistan. When your dad was just six years old, a gang of men literally armed with torches and sticks showed up at his door and your dad and his family had to hide on the terrace to escape being killed. And the very next day they fled Karachi uh, for Bombay. And I'm wondering, how did your parents end up in Casablanca, northern Africa, uh, from from these beginnings? Yeah, well, we're ethnically Sindhi. So for anyone who knows of the Sindhi community, the fact of being flung all over the world is not going to be surprising to you. Um, but it's an ethnic group, as you mentioned, originally from what's now Pakistan. Um, and my parents, they had different trajectories. Uh, my mom's family who was a little bit better off than my dad's side, or actually much better off than my dad's side, they ended up moving from um, from Hyderabad, now modern-day Pakistan, uh, briefly down to India, and then they went over to Spain. Um, and uh, my mom, you know, Spanish was her best language. Now Spanish and English are her best language. And for life, she's always been teased for how bad her Hindi is and how terrible her accent is and kind of how Western she is. Um, and from Spain, you know, Spain is just a, a short trip down to Morocco. Basically, her family kind of traveled that corridor. Um, and part of her family, part of her very large family ended up in Casablanca. Um, my dad was the first in his nuclear family to leave the subcontinent. They were much poorer. Um, My dad grew up, it was 13 siblings and and the parents, um, and they were living, you know, in basically one room mud shack where, you know, the floor was cow dung and it was dad's job to, you know, spread out the cow dung to, to, to fix the floor regularly. You know, they went to the bathroom in an outhouse, that kind of thing. My mom, my mom actually didn't realize how poor my father was growing up. That's not something he told her about. Um, and dad was the first in his family to leave the subcontinent. And he went as a migrant worker when he was a teenager, he left to go work in Beirut. Um, this is now we're talking about 
the the late 1960s, early 1970s. And Beirut was like the Paris of the Middle East. And it was a place where you could get great work. Um, and he had a tough job. I mean, he was like a low level migrant worker at some shop um, where, you know, he was he didn't have freedom of movement. He had to ask permission to leave the premises. He had to ask permission to hang out with friends. It was a very controlled experience for him. But from there, slowly but surely, he found other work. And then he ended up traveling from Beirut throughout the Middle East and Northern Africa. He spent a little bit of time in Algeria as well. Then he landed in Casablanca, Morocco, just following the migrant trail of job opportunities. Um, he brought his brothers along the way. Uh, so that they could find work as well. And then one day, my mom's big sister, who had met this handsome young man named Namdev Shahani, uh, thought, hey, he seems like a good guy. Uh, you're from the same ethnic group. Maybe we should consider marrying the two of you. And so it was. Now, your grandmother, your dad's mother, lived with your parents in Casablanca, where you were born. And she was incredibly abusive, I guess is the word, to your mother to the point where your parents abruptly decided to pack up their things, roll the dice, come to America. When did you fully come to understand the painful things that your grandmother kind of made your own mother endure? You know, I'd say I still don't fully understand it. Um, abuse is not a word that our families, and by, by, by our, I mean we in the South Asian community, use very much, um, but it's rampant in our families. Um, you know, domestic violence is a big problem in the South Asian community at home and abroad. Um, and I came to learn a little bit while writing the memoir um, and interviewing my loved ones, including my mom. Um, I came to learn a little bit more some, you know, really kind of shocking and disturbing and uncomfortable details. Like, you know, I feel self-conscious recounting the things that my mom went through with her mother-in-law. Um, but I did write about it and here we are in my memoir. Um, and so things like, for example, mom told me that um, my grandmother would not allow my mom and dad to sleep in the same room. So my father was required to sleep in the room with his mom and my mom was required to sleep in the living room, which just feels like really creepy. Um, my mom wasn't allowed to leave the home without permission. She wasn't allowed at times to open the refrigerator without permission. Uh, my daddy, my grandmother would throw things at my mom if she didn't like what was made or whatnot. Um, and a detail I really had no idea about until I began writing and researching for the book is Part of why my family came to America had to do with my grandmother's reaction to my birth, um, specifically my gender. Uh, when my parents brought me home from the hospital, my grandmother was incredibly upset that I was a girl and not a boy. And she cursed at my mom for bringing home another wretched daughter, which would be another mouth to feed. Uh, you know, another dowry to be made. You know, she didn't want to let us into the home. She was really angry that I was a girl and not a boy. Um, you know, I'd be another mouth to feed, uh, another dowry to be paid. Um, and so, you know, there are many things that were happening in that very dysfunctional um, uh, household. Um, but ultimately, it, it's interesting to me learning that you know, you know, it's funny when, when you ask your parents, hey, mom and dad, why did we come to America anyway? Like, why did you cross the Atlantic? Why did you take those risks? Um, you usually get kind of generic stock answers like, oh, for a better life for you kids or for opportunity, like it's these very generic things. And what you don't hear as much is like the granular nuance of what was actually happening in your parents' lives. Right. But they they had real lives, just like we have real lives and they were really navigating things. And so what I learned in my family's case was, you know, what pushed my parents to cross the Atlantic and roll the dice and live in Queens with three little kids and no real game plan. You know, what really pushed them was uh, an incredibly uncomfortable situation at home and that I was born a girl and not a boy. Now, when you're 
family does eventually make it to Queens and they settle down. Things weren't that easy either. You document in great detail the roach infested apartment in Flushing where you lived at the time when your, your parents were sort of barely scraping by. And I listened to an interview that you recently gave in which you talked about your parents as unsung heroes of low end globalization. What what do you mean by that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, what is it that makes America uniquely great, distinct? I mean, this is the greatest project. Um, rather, this is the greatest experiment in democracy that the world has ever seen. Um, when I think it through, it's that so many people, humble, working class people who are just looking for opportunity, who are just looking to realize their potential, cross whatever borders they have crossed and find a way to coexist with each other, to fuse cultures, to build trust and build a country. My parents have been part of that great American experiment. Um, the working class migrants who make up this country, who make us the epicenter of global culture, great food, great entertainment, great movies, great music, great science, great literature. I mean, that exists because so many working class people were willing to come here and be uncomfortable and coexist. And my parents were part of that. And I'd say that that's actually the majority of migrants, right? As a Silicon Valley reporter who spent time, you know, r telling stories also about sort of the exceptional um, billionaire class and people who have really made it in, in the tech industry in particular, what you can consistently see, even in those huge stories that we herald of the exceptional, you know, the, the exceptional immigrant is a group of much more humble family members <laughs> with much more humble backgrounds that have supported that journey. Um, and so, you know, I think of my parents and many of our parents and many of the newcomers coming here today as actually the essence of what makes this country great um, as the sort of the, the fuel of our, you know, multicultural democracy it's interesting right now in these times of COVID-19 and all of us living in quarantine and house arrest, because, you know, I live in a region where it's been ordered that only essential workers need to leave the house. And so suddenly working class people are the essential workers, right? Like it, our definition of what essential is has changed very quickly in a time of real crisis. So after that initial struggle, Arthi, your father and his brother, your uncle, they ran a wholesale electronics store on 28th and Bar Broadway in Manhattan. It grew successful enough over the years that your family could afford to move from Flushing from Queens and buy a house in the suburbs of New Jersey, which sounds like, you know, kind of upward social mobility. Things were sort of, you know, looking up until one day the police showed up at your dad's store. Tell us about his arrest and what he and your uncle were charged with. Why did the police show up? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this case and how it unfolded is really, it's the plot in, in my memoir, Here We Are. It's what unfolds for my family over many years. But basically the police come in, they arrest my dad and uncle, and it kind of sounds like they're telling us that our family business is a front for the Kali drug cartel of Columbia. Um, they're brought into Queens criminal court. They're told that they're money laundering for drug traffickers. Um, and, you know, it's interesting when I think back on it, because I remember that very first court hearing, you know, my childhood goal was to become a prosecutor one day. That's why I aspire to be. And I remember going to court, uh, not telling anyone at school why I was missing school. Uh, I was at that point a scholarship kid at a very fancy prep school in Manhattan. Um, and I remember going to court and hearing it's the people versus the Shahanis. I was like, oh, my God, we're not the people anymore. Like, what is going on here? Um, and and it just sounded like my it sounded like my father was like a really heinous, cold blooded person who would do anything to make a buck. You know, like we're talking about the Kali drug cartel. I mean, they were they were like pushing cocaine and crack to kids. They were you know, they assassinated a journalist at a diner in Jackson Heights. I mean, this is a very bad group of people. Um and I remember being really angry at my father 
really ashamed of him. Um, and then as the case continued, court hearings continued, things continued, a really interesting thing happened. The prosecutor came around and said, hey, Mr. Shahani, why don't you just agree to take an eight month sentence, get it over with, and then just go back to running your family business, put the whole matter behind you. And it was like such a change of tone from you're a front for money launderers to this is just a small thing. Take a plea. It'll be over soon. And, you know, I remember at that point, my father and my uncle, they were offered this plea deal and they were so tortured about it because they could not understand why selling watches and calculators was illegal. Uh, granted, they were selling it for cash. And I write about that very transparently in my book, the way specifically businesses, small businesses in uh, Manhattan's wholesale district worked. Um, but they kept thinking and saying, we're just doing what everybody's doing. Why are we in trouble for doing what everybody's doing? Anyway, their lawyers explained to them, hey, you can go to trial if you want to, but then you're going to face something called the trial penalty. So you can take eight months now in a plea deal, or if you go to trial and you're convicted, face 13 years, 14 years, 15 years. Okay. Because yes, it's your constitutional right to go to trial, but if convicted, you can be penalized for exercising that right. So they did what everyone does, statistically speaking, just about what everyone does. It's what you would have done. It's what I would have done. They took the plea deal. But um, here's the but here's the crazy thing about that, which is the most astonishing revelation to me in your book is something that took place many years after your dad's arrest when you sought out the judge who sentenced your dad to prison. And the judge sits down and tells you to your face that your father never should have even taken that eight-month plea deal he was given. He never should have been convicted. He never should have been incarcerated. How did you manage to maintain your composure in the face of a judge who was basically saying that your dad's case was kind of a giant mistake? Well, <laughs> I don't know that I managed to keep my composure that well. Um, I want to I want to revise though, or I want to sort of clarify a bit of of how you've summarized it. What the judge told me, and I wouldn't even say that I sought him out. It's more like he happened to land in my lap somehow. Like I was going about my life, being an NPR journalist, and then I got some LinkedIn message from the guy who ran the jail where my father was locked up, Rikers Island. That guy and I talked. He happened to know the judge in the case, and he offered to broker a reunion. It was just kind of the strangest LinkedIn message I've ever gotten and probably will ever get in my entire life. And I should just mention for our listeners that the other strange bit about this is that you and the judge had a very unique relationship to the point where the judge referred to you as his pen pal because you used to write him quite regularly about the case. Yeah, when the case was unfolding and things kept going horribly wrong in the case, for example, my, my dad and uncle agreed to take their plea deals and my uncle, instead of doing eight months, ended up doing two and a half years because New York State made an administrative error. Um I ended up getting involved and the shame I had originally felt pretty much crumbled and I felt a great deal of outrage and indignation and the need to get involved. Um, but that judge, you know, when he and I reunited in our kind of unlikely reunion uh, once I was an adult, you know, adult are the NPR correspondent sort of fancy professional life. Um, you know, what he told me was basically from where he was sitting, the Shahani brothers were basically the fall guys for a botched drug war investigation that led to no drug dealers. So New York State needed to convict somebody because they'd poured some resources into investigating the Cali drug cartel. They couldn't get some real cartel members, but they got this electronic store where they visited. So they decided to go ahead and extract a prosecution from those small business owners, i.e. my dad and uncle. And, you know, from where the judge was sitting, my dad and uncle could have pushed back a lot harder. You know, he had listened to this discovery. He had listened to the information that we didn't yet listen to in terms of the, the evidence that was that was offered by the state. And he felt like going to trial would have been a, a really feasible option. Um, and, you know, what, what strikes me about 
what the judge told me. And I don't believe, by the way, that the judge was telling me, I know your dad and uncle were totally innocent. Because to know that, you actually have to go to trial and you actually have to investigate it with that level of thoroughness. So let's be clear about what he could and could not know. But what the judge was telling me very clearly was, yeah, these guys were just some small business owners trying to feed a family. They weren't cartel members. And they took the fall for something because somebody had to. And so, you know, part of what I'm doing in my memoir, and here we are, is yes, I'm tracing the journey of an immigrant family. And we happen to be an immigrant family that's been through America's criminal justice system. That system has touched and ruined many, many lives. And I believe that what my family offers as a case study for our country is look at some people who had the best of intentions to feed their family and look at how they were punished for that intention. Your dad's case obviously affected you in so many ways, not just personally, but it also changed your kind of trajectory of your career. I mean, you took time off of your undergraduate education at the University of Chicago to essentially become a community organizer. And you were working with tons of immigrant families looking for a way to stay in America. You know, what lessons did this experience teach you about our immigration system and how it works? Mm. You know, I... <laughs> I'd stopped going to college um, in my efforts to fight to keep my dad in this country. I decided that I needed to give my full attention to that effort um, for a brief period of time. Um, I did not realize that a fight I thought I was going to fight for, you know, maybe six months or maybe 12 months ended up being something that lasted until I was age 30. I had no idea that, that was going to happen, that I would fight until I was 30. Uh, on this campaign. And in the process, I met, you know, a thousand other New Yorkers in the same boat. Um, what I have learned is that my family and the other New Yorkers I met were at the forefront of a very new chapter in American history. Okay. It's actually hard to remember this, but mass deportation the regular plucking out and expelling of people who've been here for a long time, that's a new thing in our country's modern history that has not been going on consistently throughout, you know, um, since the founding. It's ebbed and flowed. Typically, it's happened uh, in cycles and raids. But now we have this machinery in place that's churning constantly and constantly and constantly. And what kind of terrifies me about it is that We've built up this mass deportation system, and literally, there's just, there's no humanity in it. Like by law, for example, this will shock most people. It's not like when you go into deportation, um, a judge is going to look at you and decide, hey, should you be deported or not? How is it going to impact your American citizen kids? Things like that. No, what happens is it's actually mandatory. So you go into a proceeding and a judge literally has no right to judge. It's just a rubber stamped procedure. Doesn't matter if your kids were born here. Doesn't matter if, for example, one of them has cancer and needs you here to be a provider. None of this stuff matters. So I think it's a pretty horrific system that, you know, give it another 10, 20, 30, 40 years, we'll look back at what we've allowed to be created here with a lot of shame that we have, as a society, as a nation of immigrants, have allowed this kind of treatment of immigrants. Um, and the other thing I'd say is the, the community organizing work I did exposed me just to so many different immigrant families. And, you know, Melan, what you're saying about, you know, what is normal? Who are we actually as South Asians? I mean, you know, the South Asian community is full of working class people struggling to make it and betting on the future and the outcomes of their children. That's a lot of what we see. I mean, what, think about the desi cab drivers in New York. Think about the, mo the people running motels, the people pumping gas at the gas station. That's our community, right? And so what, what breaks my heart is that for those of us who have made it, who've had the opportunity to live elite or even just middle-class lives, do we actually remember where we came from? 
do we actually see the sacrifices made by our parents, our uncles, our aunties, you know? I mean, I think the silver lining in your particular family story, this may not apply to the other New Yorkers who struggled and maybe didn't get this kind of resolution, but you eventually helped your dad win U.S. citizenship. And and that was no small feat, given that ICE had slated him for deportation. Oh, yeah. You know, the the former Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, she was quite... um, it left an impression on her that I had managed to pull that off while I was r- writing the book and reporting and doing the interviews I needed. I had managed to get in touch with her. She was kind enough to have a conversation with me. And uh, when I described to her my father's legal situation and the fact that we were ultimately able to keep him here, you know, uh, she said that it was uh, quite a miracle. Uh, and you know, in her tone, I heard a kind of sort of, it's not the norm that we won, but we did. But then you have this really striking line where you essentially say, look, we achieved this remarkable goal, but, quote, the fight for your dad missed the central fact of his life that, you know, maybe America wasn't home. And so looking back on it now with the benefit of hindsight and everything that's happened, do you think America ever became your father's true home? Yeah, of course. Of course it did. Because he has this struggle in the end about going back to India, and he does go there to visit family um, and falls very ill while he's there. But there was a sense of this push and pull between kind of homeland and and the land of his adopted home. Mm -hmm. It surprised me. And I think that part of why I needed to write the book, you know, books are hard to write, right? Like they, they take a lot of, <laughs> they take effort. <laughs> yes, so, they do. <laughs> if you're going to do it, it better be over something that you existentially need to work out. Um, I existentially needed to work out whether or not fighting to keep him here was a mistake because I put so much of myself into it. I forced his hand so much in it. And I didn't know if that campaign was me just being bullheaded and tone deaf and a mistake, you know, similarly to how his plea deal was a mistake, maybe my campaign was a mistake and I needed to work that out. I needed to know. And so, you know, writing was my way of figuring it out to make sense of the facts of our life. You know, how do they line up? And I think that for me, what helped me to see my father and his sense of identity and belonging more clearly is, you know, you can live life in many, many places, but you can only die in one. And my father chose to pass in America. And that's a very powerful fact that I can't actually ignore as much as my regret and, you know, and mixed emotions and conflicted feelings about the past want to rear themselves. I can't ignore the choice that he made. Your father's passing obviously is one of the most deeply painful reflections in this book, but there's also, uh, and simultaneously, an incredible reunion that takes place, uh, well, at least simultaneously in the book. There may, time may have passed between the two events, but it happens on the next to last page of the book. To summarize your brother's story, we haven't spoken about him yet. He was once married to an Indian woman named Anisha, and he and his wife had a son named Akshay. At some point, your sister-in-law withdraws almost all of the money from the checking account she shared with your brother, and she absconds to India with their son, Akshay, who's a baby at this point. And you and your family are cut off from him for years. But the book ends with Akshay coming back to America, I think, to attend school and eventually moves in with you. Can you tell us about his return and what's he doing now? Yeah, he's my roommate. <laughs> <laughs> he's listening to this we're, conversation right now. <laughs> no, no, he's not listening. But, you know, we're we're under house arrest together and shelter in place in Oakland. I mean, it's, you know, this is the thing. <laughs> Life is long. And um, our ties as family, man, they are strong. They are very, very strong. And so, you know, you can have someone you think you've been cut off from, you think is lost to you. Maybe you had a fight. (laughs) Maybe they were kidnapped. Um, (laughs) There are lots of reasons we lose touch with our loved ones. But, you know, if they are still walking this earth... um, 
you know, don't be surprised if you find each other. Like it is uh, the bonds between us as family. It is really powerful. And I just feel like my entire life has been experiencing that over and over again. We didn't touch upon this earlier, but um, this is a good segue. You know, when your dad was arrested, he was arrested along with his brother, uh, whose name was Rutten, and and you had a difficult relationship with this uncle. Um, you recount one particularly evocative moment where you were at a dinner party, and he was kind of bullying you into joining the other women and the other girls in the kitchen to help with the cooking, and you hold your ground, and eventually he sort of threatens you, saying, you know, you better go to the kitchen, I'm going to break your mouth, and and you respond confidently by saying, you know, this is America, if he touches you, you're going to have him arrested, and but when you get older, you establish... I'm not sure, by the way, how confident I was when I said that. I think it's more like my, my leg was shaking, my voice was breaking, and I literally, you know, maybe with tears in my eyes said, lay a finger on me. And right. Well, it certainly comes America. across as, wow. <laughs> it, it didn't get to that, but, but you established this respect for him over time, right? And coming back to the bonds of family, tell us about how your views on your uncle changed. Well, I would say that not that they changed so much as they expanded, right? Um, what can happen is when someone upsets you, uh, in my case, when someone threatens you, as he did to me, um, and that was messed up of him. There's no excuse for what he had done. Um, you can form a singular narrative about who they are, right? That person is just an a-hole or just a thug or just whatever, fill in the blank. And when he and my father got into legal trouble, I'd say that two things happened and actually how we saw each other changed. Um, what I saw in my uncle was deep loyalty to his big brother. I mean, my uncle literally asked if he could serve my father's sentence for him because he didn't want my dad to spend a day in jail. I mean, that's love. You know, you have to respect that. You have to see it. So I saw that even if he was a bully to me, there were some good qualities in him. And the other thing I would say is that he saw in me a lot of potential and support that he never thought a girl could have. He assumed the boys go and do the hard work and the girls go make the food. That was his narrative about life. And then he saw, oh, <laughs> it's the youngest girl in the family who's rising up to write to the judge to scold the lawyers to get justice served. That surprised him too. So I want to come back and ask you something that we talked about earlier, but I want to frame it in a slightly different way, which is there's a particular narrative in the United States about the Indian American experience, right? So if you look at the data by any metric, whether it's median household income, whether it's average education, whether it's average salary, so on and so forth, Indian Americans are literally off the charts, right? And I'm wondering, do you see your book as reclaiming a kind of different narrative, right? One that tells Americans that there's no one Indian American experience. I would say two things. First of all, data tends to undercount or totally ignore people who are undocumented. So I'm not actually so sure that the data is reflective of where South Asian households in aggregate really are. Um, the other thing, though, I would say, and this is the more important point, is that it is very easy for people who have made it to tell themselves a story about, hey, we're just on top. I could do that, right? I could say like, hey, I went to Harvard. I'm, you know, a voice on NPR. I interview Silicon Valley, I interview Silicon Valley billionaires. I'm the good immigrant. And I think that the danger of that kind of story is that it's false. For every quote unquote good immigrant, you've got somebody who is quote unquote low level, who doesn't matter who maybe got arrested or ticketed or fined while they were living about their daily lives, just trying to make it to put their kids through college or get their kids a step ahead. I've seen throughout the South Asian community, for all the stories we tell about doctors, we have plenty of cab drivers, um, motel workers, 
gas station attendants. I mean, there are any number of working class people in our community in this country who hope that their kids can be the doctors, the lawyers, the engineers, the startup founders, but that's not their truth. And so I don't know that I'm actually reclaiming a narrative so much as documenting a fact that we've pretty much ignored because for various reasons, both American stereotyping and our self-stereotyping, our desire for a very clean narrative, we've just shut out that, that story. So Arthi, I want to ask you one last question, which is about India. Um, the, a lot of the book is about the Indian American experience, but you were at one point an Indian citizen. You held an Indian passport when you were younger. I'm curious, what's your And isn't connect- it funny that I never, I never had set foot on India and yet I had an Indian passport. I mean, that's sort of the reality of the world. Well, yeah. And that's, and that's what I'm wondering, sort of, you know, I'm assuming you've been to India between now and then. What, what's your connect, what's your connection to India now? How would you characterize it? Yeah, I think that I actually, I go to India regularly. Um, I'm the only person in my immediate family who does. I make it a point to go back, uh, whether it's for work or for social reasons. And, you know, India is a place that I hope I get to learn and know and be connected to more and more. I actually thought about Here We Are as my, of my memoir as an opportunity to rebuild a relationship that was pretty much, you know, appended because of how the world was reorganized post-colonialism, right? I am a child of low-end globalization. Um, and, you know, what I love, absolutely love about India is the rootedness that people feel in their families and communities in a way that Americans in general don't feel as much of because we're such a young country and the roots here are so much uh, uh, less deep, weaker, kind of less established. And so, you know, I, I would hope that by writing this memoir and telling people around the world, I mean, I hear from Indians around the world, by the way, who have read the story, who have who who relate to it in different ways. You know, in some ways, it's a call and response to back home as well. It's like, hey, here's one of your children telling you how life has been going here in the U.S. and let's find ways to keep in touch better. My guest on the show today is Arthi Shahani. She's the author of the book, Here We Are, American Dreams, American Nightmares. Here's what Guy Raz, the co-creator of the TED Radio Hour, had to say about the book. Arthi's book is destined to take its place amongst the finest memoirs written in recent decades, a heartbreaking, hilarious, and tender love letter to the millions of people who have made their way across lands and oceans to try and find a new life in America. This this is a book that will take you on a vivid, almost cinematic journey that is both beautiful and unforgettable. Arthi, thanks so much for sharing your story uh, in this book, and thanks so much for sharing your story with us on the show today. It was great to talk to you. Oh, thank you so much. Grant the Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthemasha.com. Production assistance comes from Megan Maxwell and Rachel Osnos. Tim Martin is our audio engineer and Lauren Dueck is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week.